What is death? Well, finally, we've come to this ultimate of questions, which I want to answer for you here very clearly without equivocation. But I hope you can appreciate the depth of this topic and how tricky and challenging it is. And some of the things I'm going to say here are very advanced insights, some of the most advanced insights that you can have about life, reality, and self. And some of the things I'm going to say are going to sound outrageous, are going to sound insane, are going to sound impossible. And yet, they're true, and you can discover for yourself that they're true. So anything that I'm about to say that sounds far-fetched to you, that sounds Looney Tunes to you, that sounds fantastical and impossible, just understand that, first of all, I'm not saying it from a position of ideology or belief. This is not a belief system of mine, number one. Number two, I'm not expecting you to adopt this as an ideology or as a belief system of yours. That's not the intent of this communication. This is, if anything I say has any validity whatsoever, you can validate it for yourself in your own direct experience. And so that's the place that I'm speaking from. If it sounds incredible, that's because it is. It's highly incredible, and yet nonetheless, you can still validate it for yourself without needing to believe me. So, here we go. <laughs> Do you really want to know what is death? What is death? Well, first, before I tell you... Um, See, the biggest mistake people make about death is they take death for granted as a given. And they also assume, first of all, they assume that there is such a thing as death, that death is real. Secondly, they assume that it's impossible to know what comes with death or after death. And that anybody who tells you that they know what death is or what comes after death that these people are deluded, that they're religious nutcases, that they just have beliefs, that they're just speculating, that they just have theories, or that they, they just they, they don't want to face the harsh realities of the emptiness of death or the unknown. They don't want to say that they don't know, so therefore they just make stuff up, right? This is the standard assumption. But this assumption needs to be questioned. Because when you truly admit that you don't know something, that's not the same thing as saying that it's never possible to know something. So, if right now you honestly don't have a direct experience of what death is, you're not conscious of it, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. That's Most people in life are in that situation. If you find yourself in that situation, be honest. And tell yourself, I don't know what death is. That's great. That's a great, honest place to start from. But it's a very gross mistake of epistemology to make the additional leap or conclusion where you then say, well, and, and therefore, because I don't know right now, that it's impossible to know and that nobody could ever know. That's not something you have a direct experience of. You don't know that it's impossible to know. You just assume so. So I want you to be conscious that you've assumed that your whole life. Also, I want you to be conscious that you have assumed that death is a real thing. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that it never occurred to you in your entire life, nor anybody around you? None of your family members, none of your friends, none of your teachers, none of your professors, none of your clergy people, uh, none of your scientists even, that you learned from. It has never occurred to you or to any of these people to ever sit down and question the validity of the notion of death.
See, a lot of people will act skeptical to my proclamations here that I'm going <laughs> to make in a minute about what death is. And they'll say, oh, Leo, but you're, you're just a blind believer and you don't really, you're not skeptical enough. Really? I'm not skeptical enough or you're not skeptical enough? Have you actually been skeptical about death? Why do you think death is real? Why do you assume that? You think that death is a scientifically proven fact? Or is death something that you're interpreting? Is death maybe something you're projecting onto reality? Why do you assume it's real? See, all of this is taken for granted. Death is just assumed to be a fact. Well, that's not actually the case. So, what happens when you actually die? When you actually die, you dissolve into an ocean of infinite love and consciousness. So what death is, it's, 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 it's several things. I just want to state it very clearly here, and then we'll go into depth elaborating upon all these different formulations of death that I'm going to give you. So death is equivalent to infinite love, number one. Death is equivalent to infinite consciousness, number two. Death is equivalent to God, number three. Death is immortality, number four. Death is paradise or heaven, number five. All of these are synonymous, just different facets, different ways of looking at what death is, but they all come together. There's no contradiction between these. They all come together. Death is, uh, what are we, number six now? I don't know, remember the number. Uh, death is complete non-duality complete formlessness, a total lack of identity of any kind, the collapsing of all dualities. And so the biggest mindfuck of life is to discover that death is actually infinite love. Because that's the last thing that you expect death to be. We as humans, because we're so terrified of death, we demonize death, that we think that death is going to be the worst thing that's ever happened to us. It's the worst possible thing that can happen to you, right? Everything else in life, all the other terrible stuff that can happen to you in life, is all relative to sort of the absoluteness of death. That's how we tend to think of things. And we spend our whole life trying to avoid death. Almost everything we do is, is predicated upon the need to avoid death. But if you think about it, if you ask yourself, why am I so afraid of death? Why are humans so afraid of death? If we don't know what it is, if none of us have ever experienced it, as many of us claim, and in fact, if we say it's impossible to know what death is, that sort of conventional uh, wisdom, if, if that's the case, how do you know that death isn't the greatest thing that's ever going to happen to you in your life? You don't. You assume it's the worst. When someone close to you dies, you cry for them and you assume it's the worst thing that could happen to them. When your dog or your cat dies, you assume it's the worst thing that could happen to them. When you see death on the news, when you're watching some war zone and you're seeing bodies getting carried out in body bags, you think, well, this is, this is terrible. People's lives have been cut short and how unfair life is that these people have died prematurely. Children have died and innocent animals have, have been killed and, and all this sort of stuff, right? But if you don't know what death is and you don't, by your own admission, if you're honest, then why do you ascribe all this negativity to it? Can you see that there's nothing scientific or objective or factual about what you're doing? You're assigning a meaning and interpretation to something you have no idea what it really is. See? Can you see how that could be a problem? 
Can you see how your own irrational fear of death distorts and skews your perception of reality? After all, why do you fear death? Is there something objectively bad about you, let's say, ceasing to exist, if that's what you believe death is? What's bad about that? Well, objectively, neutrally speaking, of course, nothing. The reason it seems bad to you is because it seems bad to you, because you're selfish. See, and you have a self-biased perspective on reality. And so everything that you judge to be bad, the whole notion of bad is completely relative to the thing, the ultimate thing that you call bad, which is what you've called death or the end of your survival. The end of yourself. But what if the self and survival, that this is just a self-bias you have, that there's nothing important or special or even good about it. You see? So you see, to really appreciate what I'm talking about here, you need to have watched my episode called Self-Bias and also Understanding Survival Part 1 and Part 2 because what we're really getting at here is we're getting to the very core of self-bias. Self-bias how your own selfishness distorts your perception of reality. And so one of the chief problems of self-bias is that when you're self-biased, you're selfish basically, everything you look at gets distorted through the lens of, of the self, of what yourself needs. And what you need is to keep surviving as the self you believe that you are, whatever that is. See, And so you might say, well, Leo, what's the problem with that? I mean, I got to survive, don't I? To a certain extent, you do. But also the problem with that is what's the cost of looking at the world in a selfish way? The cost of looking at the world in a selfish way is that you don't see it for what it really is. You only see it for how it can serve you. Well, the ultimate cost of that is that if you believe that you are a self and you identify with being some particular self and you're now engaging in survival your entire life, defending and protecting that self, well, this process can't last forever. It's a finite process. It has to end at some point. And so therefore, now you have committed yourself to fighting against that end your whole life. But also at the back of your mind, you know that end is coming. You sense it's coming and you're afraid of it. And see now, if you look at the universe as though it has a beginning, or you look at your own life as though it has a beginning, necessarily, because that's a duality, it's going to also have the end of that beginning. You can't have a beginning without an end, and you can't have an end without a beginning. See? So, just by thinking that you, as an individual being, had a beginning, necessarily that means there's going to be uh, an end to it. See? And ordinarily, what we assume is just, we, we assume that, well, of course, how else could it be? Yeah, I have a life, I have a beginning, and then I have an end. So, this is totally natural and normal, and it's this is just how reality is. But what if that's not how reality is? What if that is a function of how the mind looks at reality? What if death is not a physical event? What if death is a construction of the mind? What if your birth and your life was a construction of the mind? What then? See, this is a, a radical, counterintuitive possibility, which isn't possible and can't be taken seriously under the materialist paradigm. And that's one of the key limitations of the materialist paradigm. Under the scientific, rationalist, materialist paradigm, as the story goes, there's a physical, external reality, 
we are beings within that reality, we are conscious within that reality, but ultimately our consciousness hinges upon physical factors, atoms, molecules, brains, neurons, biology, genetics, and evolution, and many of these kind of physical stuff. So we ground ourselves in that. And then we believe that, oh, well, death is just, death is just a physical process. All physical things die. And you can't do anything about it. And you can't escape it. And so the only solution is to just accept it. But that's assuming that the materialist paradigm is true. What if it's not true? What if there is no external reality? What if there never was? What if that's just concepts and ideas? What if that is a part of how you invented yourself as a self? You see, to really understand how death works, you have to understand how life works and how birth works because you can't have death without birth. And of course, we take birth for granted as a biological process. It's not a biological process. It's a process of constructing an identity. To be alive at all, you need to construct an identity. Identity is not a scientific fact. Identity is something you construct. And identity is a totally relativistic notion. This is another mistake that materialists make and common sense makes. Is we tend to think that, well, I'm a human. I'm this biological organism sitting here. What else could I be? Or like a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat and a tree is a tree. And when a tree dies, a tree dies. And when a cat dies, a cat dies. And when a dog dies, a dog dies. And when a human dies, a human dies. No. A tree was never born to begin with. A tree doesn't think of itself as a tree. You think of a tree as a tree. When you say that a tree dies, you are the one who is projecting death onto that tree, and you are the one who's even projecting the identity of a tree being a tree onto the tree. There is no tree. There's colors and shapes and sounds, but there's no such thing as an entity called a tree, not from the point of view of the tree. This is the key you have to understand here to understand death. Identity is the key to death and to life. What you identify as is totally relative and arbitrary. You could identify with being a playboy. You can identify with being gay. You can identify with being black. You can identify with being president of the United States. You can identify with being uh, shy and introverted. You can identify with being wealthy and successful. You can identify with being a human or an alien or a spiritual being or an animal or whatever. There's no limit to what you can identify, identify yourself to be. And you have many layers of identification to you. So you identify with being human, most likely. You identify with being male or female. You identify with being successful or not successful. And maybe you identify with your career, and you identify with your family, and you identify with your race, and you identify with your, we already said gender, um, maybe your nation, being American or Japanese or Norwegian or whatever. See, these are all layers to your identity. And perhaps most fundamentally, you identify with being a living entity, a biological entity. That might be your most fundamental identity. See? Well, what if these things were not facts, but things your own mind constructed? So what I mean here is this, the following radical thing. See if you can uh, accept this in your mind as a possibility. 
that what I'm telling you is if you stopped telling yourself that you are a man or a woman or black or white or even human or even a biological thing, if you stopped telling yourself that you are any of those things, you would never have been born, is what I'm telling you. Can you open your mind to that possibility? That your birth was not a biological process. You telling yourself that your birth was a biological process is part of the identity that you created. You see, because if you can create an identity where your identity is not something you created, but is in your mind, you tell yourself is something that is biological and external and out of your hands. It's not something you did. It's something that happened to you. It's something that's a biological, physical fact. If you create that kind of identity for yourself as a human, and you furthermore, you add that it couldn't be any other way. This is just what's true. This is reality. You tell yourself. If you construct that identity, that is your identity. And it's going to feel to you as though you're a real, living, biological human who was born and who's going to die. And that there's no other way it could be. Are you open to such a possibility? This is, in fact, what you did. This is, in fact, what you're doing. See, staying alive is not something you just did once. <laughs> you do it every single moment. And what I'm telling you is that if you keep telling yourself every single day that, well, here I am, I'm a human, I'm alive, I'm, I've got a name, whatever your name is, I've got a gender, I'm, I'm a Christian or I'm a Muslim, or I'm a scientist, or I'm an atheist, or I'm a skeptic, or whatever you believe you are, if you keep telling yourself that, that is how you maintain your birth. And what I'm suggesting to you is the following. If you stopped telling yourself those things, you would die. Which is precisely why it's not in your interest to understand the things that I'm saying here. Because if you understood the things that I'm saying here, it would be a, a serious threat to you. So again, what is death? Death is the end of your identification with whatever you identify with. If you identify with being rich and then you lose all your wealth and then you get the idea in your mind that you're never going to be wealthy again because you're just no good and you suck and because, you know, that wealth was just a one-time fluke, you're never going to get back and that you're destined to be a poor person. Literally what's happening in a sense is that a part of you is dying when that happens. Now, of course, not the human biological part because remember I said there's many layers to your identity. So just because you lose the top layer, the surface layer of you being some wealthy billionaire, you lose that. And when you lose that, notice you're going to go through a mourning process very similar to the process people go through when they lose a loved one or a pet. There's going to be a mourning process of losing your millions of dollars and your reputation and your identity as being uh, a wealthy hotshot. But you'll get over it. You'll get over it. And then your identity will change. It'll become something else. Now, now this is still surface level stuff. If we keep digging lower and lower and lower, we get to the very core of your, of your identity, your identity of being a human being who was born. If somehow you manage to question that identity and to deconstruct it and to completely let it go, what would happen is that you would die. I don't mean that you would stop seeing colors and shapes. Your identity would die. And from that point on, if you never thought again in your life going forward, if you never thought again 
the idea of I am a human. If you never thought that anymore, if you even removed the word I from your vocabulary from that point on, you never thought anymore, it would be as though you were never born in the first place. Life would go on. You would eat. You would go to the bathroom. You could even go to work. But it would be as though you were never born. This stuff would be happening, but it wouldn't be your identity anymore. This body would be doing stuff. It would be talking. It would be thinking even. It would be moving its hands and doing stuff. But it would be like you're, uh, you're dead inside. Your identity is gone. But then you might wonder, well, in that case, what would I actually be? What would be my identity? Like, let's say I remove all layers, all the artificial layers of the identity. I remove my gender. I remove my race. I remove my wealth. I remove my career. I remove my family. I remove even my biology. What's left? What's left then is your true identity your identity before anything is constructed. This is what we call the true self. Capital T, capital S, or the self. Capital T, capital S, the self. This is an identity of null. It's a null identity. It's nothing. It's emptiness. It's pure consciousness, empty consciousness, formless consciousness. And at the same time, it's infinite. It's everything. So whatever is arising is you. But also, if it doesn't arise, that's also you. It doesn't matter whether something arises or doesn't arise. It's all you. Now you might say, oh, okay, okay, Leo, fine, but what about actual death? What about physical death? No, you're not getting it. <laughs> when you tell yourself, but what about actual death? What about physical death? You're imagining that. There's no such thing as physical death. The distinction you draw between some sort of psychological death and the actual physical death That's part of your identity. That's what you, you use that distinction to construct your identity because then you say, well, I exist on this end where the actual death happens. That's what's real. And then this thing here, the psychological mumbo jumbo that Leo is talking about, that's the unreal stuff. This is just philosophy. This is just intellectual me mental masturbation. This is the domain where science happens. And this is the domain of bullshit religious nonsense. If you make that distinction, that is the identity that you've constructed for yourself. So you got to remove that distinction. The distinction between the mental and the physical, this needs to go. If you want to understand what death is. So it's possible for you to become conscious of or to experience death without actually, what we would say, physically dying. The body doesn't need to die for you to become conscious of what death is. And the reason that's possible is because you never were the body. The body is an identity you constructed for yourself. So you can unconstruct, you can deconstruct that identity and you can experience what death is, become conscious of what death is without having to undergo physical death. You don't need to shoot yourself or harm yourself. If you actually were the body, if that was your ultimate identity, then you would have to actually physically harm yourself in order to understand what death is. But that was just a materialist assumption that was never deeply questioned. Now we've questioned it, and when we question it deep enough, we get to the point where we realize that, oh, I don't even need to do that to die. 
And so in this way, what becomes possible is for you to die, as they say, die before you die. Die before the body dies. Uh, you might wonder, <laughs> Leo, how do you know? How do you know this is true? Well, this is not a belief that I hold, of course. This is something I've directly become conscious of and that I've experienced. I've died many times and I've gone through this process to the point where it's not a it's not even a big deal anymore to die. Because you just know what death is. You're conscious of what it is. In fact, there's no distinction between life and death. So you can become so conscious that you realize that when you die, you don't go anywhere because there's nowhere to go. Because the idea that there's a here and a there, like while I'm alive, I'm here, but when I'm dead, I'll be somewhere else. This idea of being here or there, this, this is a duality in and of itself. There is no here or there. Everywhere is one place. Everywhere is nowhere. So try to maybe look at it from this perspective. Try to imagine that you were never actually born and that even though you think you were born, you're sitting there right now, but right now, everything you've ever experienced, your whole life that you've called your life and you've called birth and all this, that all of this has been death the entire time. So imagine that this video, my voice is speaking to you. I'm speaking to you in your death. You're already dead because you were never alive. You were only alive as an idea, that idea alive. That's part of the identity you constructed for yourself. See? And when you quote unquote die, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to be right here. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. Of course, these are very uncomfortable truths that nobody wants to admit. See, as a society, we, we've demonized death so badly. As a society, we've, we've created a, a cultural reality out of death. Literally, we've brainwashed ourselves. Millions of, and billions of people have come together to brainwash ourselves that death is bad and horrible and terrible and that we should avoid it at all costs. And why have we done so? Because if we didn't do so, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. This is what survival entails. This is the core lie at the heart of survival. This is the core falsehood of survival, is that survival is fighting furiously to defend something which is completely unreal. Imagine that. What would you do with yourself? How would you live life if you realized that death was completely unreal and was just a social construction? If you no longer had fear of death, how might that change your attitude towards life, towards work, towards relationships? What would you do? Would there be anything left to fear anymore after you realize that death is an illusion? You see, fear is a hell of a powerful tool of self-deception. Because if you think about it, let's say there was some deep, profound truth that the devil wanted to hide from you. If we imagine a devil, the devil wants to hide this truth from humanity. How would the devil hide this truth? Would he bury it in the middle of the earth? Would he shoot it into outer space where nobody could get to it? How would he hide it from mankind? He would just simply veil it in fear. That's it. Because anything that mankind deeply, deeply fears, mankind doesn't explore. And what does mankind fear more than death? Nothing. Death is the ultimate thing that mankind fears. So it's very easy for the devil to hide truth 
simply by cloaking it in fear and calling it death. And that's exactly what the devil has done, metaphorically speaking, is uh, the devil has labeled the most truest thing there is, truth with capital T, love with capital L, infinity with a capital I, God with a capital G, has labeled that death. And so you might wonder, well, Leo, why is enlightenment such a secret and why are so few people enlightened? It's very simple. You might wonder, why, why is there no evidence of God? Because you've called God death. You might wonder, Leo, where is this love? You keep talking about infinite love. Where is the infinite love? I don't see it. Because you've called it death. You see how tricky you are? This is the very heart of devilry, what we're talking about here. This is the most fundamental deception that the devil does. The devil needs to pervert the truth and call it falsehood and turn falsehood and call it into truth. Then, only then, from that from that core self-deception, only from that place can survival happen and life can happen. If this core self-deception isn't in place, there can't be life as we know it. There can't be humanity. Death is truth. Death is love. Death is infinity. Death is God. Death is consciousness. Death is selflessness. And what you call life, that's selfishness. That's falsehood. That's delusion. That's identification. That's attachment. That's construction. That's fantasy. That's illusion. That's imagination. That's hallucination. That's survival. That's self-bias. You might wonder how on earth could death be infinite love? I'm not talking about some petty human love here. I'm not merely talking about the feelings of love. I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about existential love. I've explained it before in my episodes about what is love, part one and part two. I've explained also what truth is in my episode about what is truth. I've explained what consciousness is in my episode about what is consciousness. I've explained what God is in my episode about what is God, part one and two. So see, now we're, we're bringing all these together. Love is nothingness. Love is infinite freedom. Love is formless consciousness. So when you die, literally what happens, and it doesn't matter whether this will happen to you through an awakening experience, through enlightenment, or this will happen to you on a psychedelic, or if this happens to you at the moment of your body's physical dying, uh, which, whichever it happens on, um, for most of you, it'll be when your body physically dies. What will happen is that you, your identity will completely dissolve. So this little contracted identity that you've developed over your lifetime, this will completely dissolve and you will melt and merge into the entire universe. You will become absolutely one and indistinguishable from everything else. And with this, your life will end. And you will become infinite. You will become totally formless. You will become the Godhead. And this, this very process of dissolution into total, absolute selflessness, this is the process of, uh, of infinite love. This is the pinnacle of infinite love. So the tragedy, the tragedy of life, the beauty of life is that we struggle for 80 years. We're born and then we struggle for 80 years thinking that we're, we're you know, we're struggling against death and we're struggling against 
fear and we're struggling against all the obstacles in life that interfere with our ability to have a good life. We struggle against all that. Finally, we lose that whole struggle and we die. And we think to ourselves that, oh man, this is going to be the worst thing ever. And everything beautiful about life is going to be gone. Everything wonderful is going to be gone. And it's just going to be a bleak, empty nothingness, some sort of void of, of nihilism. Uh, or maybe you tell yourself that you're going to go to heaven, some sort of afterlife in the clouds with 72 virgins and other sorts of materialistic images like that. Um, and you tell yourself how how terrible it would be if 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 there wasn't a heaven. You tell yourself, oh, well, Leo, if, if there's not this beautiful heaven with with the pearly gates and and the 72 virgins, then I, it's just going to be blank, empty nothingness, and it's going to be terrible. It's going to be the worst. Like, you know, what kind of cruel evil God would create such a reality where instead of going to heaven, I would just end up in an existential uh, nihilistic void forever. But what you don't realize is that is infinite love. That is the very essence of heaven. Heaven is not a material place. Heaven is the total absence of self. It's completely becoming unlimited. Unlimited in every way. That's infinite love. That's heaven. That's nirvana. That's paradise. It's total formlessness. And while it's threatening to us as little egos, as little formed entities, it's threatening to us because it, it dissolves us. We lose all of our shape when this happens. Actually, what you discover in that process is you discover that that is your true form. That is the happiest you'll ever be. That is the freest you'll ever be. This is existence and reality and goodness and love in its most pure form. In otherwise, completely formless. It's almost like, imagine we have a little bit of water. Let's say we have a liter of water here on Earth. And we can put it into different containers. We can put it into a tall glass, into a, 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 a wide, flat dish. We can put it into various shapes, depending on the containers it takes, because, you know, the water is, is fluid. We can even freeze it and carve it into some sort of sculpture. And here we have this ice sculpture. And there is it, it is in its particular form. But then what happens is if we take this water and we just throw it out into the middle of empty outer space, the water just, what does it become? It just becomes a blob, an amorphous blob. We might imagine a sphere. Especially if it's like warmed up a little bit by the sun, just becomes like liquid water and just floats in a vacuum in zero G. And so it doesn't have any shape because it's being pulled equally in all directions, perfectly equally, let's let's imagine this kind of scenario. And it's liquid water, or you could imagine liquid mercury, whatever, so that it's, it's still liquid, even if it's out in the middle of space, you know, it's cold out there, but whatever. So it's liquid, and it's, just, it's a perfect sphere. See? And you might say, well, this is terrible from the point of view of an ice sculpture, because an ice sculpture needs to maintain a particular form. Otherwise, it stops being that. Literally, it dies if you break it apart into some other shape. But also, you could think of it as the following. You could think of it as when the water becomes a perfect sphere and loses all of its shape, that's when it's most essentially what it really is. It's amorphous. That is its truest nature. See, water is not an ice sculpture. Water is not tall. Water is not shallow. Water is not short. Water is not wide. Water is not a cube. Water is not... Water is amorphous. That's its essence. See? And so that's all that really death is is you're going from a shape, a particular shape that you've constructed and identified yourself with being, to being amorphous, being infinite, being omnipresent. And of course, to do this and to live from this place, and it is possible to live from this place, you don't need to actually physically die, to live from such a place, you would have to have no identity whatsoever. By having no identity, you have an infinite identity, which means you're completely universal and you're completely detached from any particular form. 
now you can appreciate why the great sages and mystics and religious teachers have told you from the very beginning that attachment is the enemy of the spiritual path. And, you know, going back all the way to Jesus in the Bible, you know, he talks about how it's easier for, uh, it's, it's as hard for a rich man to get into heaven as it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, you see. So why does he say that? Because the rich man is attached to all these material attachments, to his success, to his wealth, to his power and fame and all his accumulated houses and, and cars and all this sort of stuff. Uh, while you're attached to, to all those things, you can't become totally formless. You can't realize your total formless identity. And so you're always stuck in that particular form. And you think that form is so great, but what you don't realize is how great it is to lose all form altogether. And you're terrified. Not, not only do you not realize this, you're completely terrified of it. So no matter how much I sit here and I tell you how, about how death is absolute love and it's infinity and it's God and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's the best thing that'll ever happen to you, no matter how much I tell you all that, it doesn't matter because you're utterly terrified of it because you're so attached to your particular form and you think that I'm just bullshitting you or you think that, well, what if Leo is wrong? So no amount of my talking will get you to surrender your attachments. For that to happen, you would actually have to go through a process of death. Of self-deconstruction and self-annihilation. You'd have to go through that process. And that process will be terrifying for you, most likely. Because most of us are terrified of death. Why are we terrified of death? Because we have to be in order to be alive as these chimp-like human creatures. See? We're in a bind. We're damned if we do and damned if we don't. Because if all of us were not afraid of death, we couldn't be here talking about it. Because to be here talking about it, we have to create form. We have to create a society. We have to create a culture. We have to create technology. We have to live long enough to have children so that they can pass on information, pass on knowledge, build more technology resulting in the communication systems we have today so that I could deliver this message to you. None of this would be possible if you were totally formless and I was totally formless. But then again, none of it would be necessary either. <laughs> because what's the whole point of this communication? It's to ultimately get you to realize your total formlessness. So you might wonder, why does it need to be this way? Well, it does, I mean, it's a circle. It's a never-ending, infinite circle. See, the form which reality creates then ultimately leads to the unification and depolarization of all form and all dualities, which ultimately merges back in total unity. And then once that unity is accomplished, then that unity breaks apart De it polarizes itself, splits itself into dualities, creates form, creates life, creates reality, creates animals, creates humans, creates your life, creates technology, all of this. And then, of course, once that all's here, then it needs to come back together and unify again. And this is all that reality is. It's a, it's a polarization and depolarization process. It's a process of division and unification. So, your birth was a process of division, and your death is a process of unification. And of course, the ultimate mindfuck of it all is that there's no difference between division and, and, and unification. They're, they're totally identical. They're two sides of the same coin, you see. And you are all of that. You are the division and you are the unification. You are the birth and you are the death. So by going all the way meta, what you realize is that all this is just a process happening inside of you, the universal you, the formless you. You see, and that all of this is just a manifestation of love. This is what love is, infinite love. Ta-da, this is what you see all around you, infinite love manifesting itself, both in polarized and non-polarizing forms, through division and through unification. And this goes on to infinity forever, all the way down and all the way up. Forever. 
It's a fractal of infinite love. And you can realize this directly because this is what you are. You're not separated from it. So the greatest irony and tragedy of human life is that we all live in such terror of death and what we don't realize as humans is that death is a total illusion. Actually, death will be the most beautiful end of your life. It'll be the most beautiful thing that has ever happened to you. Now, of course, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying here that if you, if you torture a person, <laughs> that he's going to sit there and enjoy it. <laughs> of course not. So the actual circumstances by which you come to die, those can be horrific and torturous and uh, very painful and can lead to a lot of suffering. You know, if you're, if you're going through the process of being tortured before you're dead, that's going to be hell. But the actual moment of your death, that's going to be the pinnacle of life. See, that's going to be your life coming completely full circle and you merging back into your true nature and you becoming the truth, you becoming the, the entire universe, you losing your identity completely. See, and so the tragedy and irony of it all is that we humans have invented so many elaborate schemes and systems to avoid to avoid becoming the most beautiful thing that there is. And the reason that in, in all these schemes and systems, I'm talking about crimes, businesses, relationships, families, sexuality, entertainment, movies, video games, social media, politics, governments, war, all of that, all of that is just a delay tactic to avoid infinite love because the infinite love is so deep and so profound that it completely eclipses your ability to exist as a finite thing whatsoever. That's how good reality is. So while we might think that, oh my God, I'm depressed or something bad happened in my life, we might think, oh, this is so, why does life have to be so terrible? <laughs> no, 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 no. Life is so terrible precisely because life is infinite love. But it's precisely because life is infinite love that it's so epic in its goodness that if you were to see its full goodness, you would cease to exist and nobody would even know that you existed. So if you want to exist, you have to deny, actively deny infinite love. And that's literally what you've been doing your whole life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You'd already be gone. You'd have already merged into infinite love. So the only ones of us that are here in humanity and in society that are talking about life and reality and science and all this stuff are the ones who are terrified of infinite love because those of us who weren't, we're already dead. We're gone. We're out of here. <laughs> you can't talk to those people. They're, they're already in infinite love. And of course, going to infinite love is not, don't imagine as going some other place, like some sort of super hidden dimension somewhere. No, 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 no. Going into infinite love is right here, right now. This, all of this. So when your grandmother dies or your grandfather dies or your parents die or your children dies or your know, children die or your, your pet dies, your friend dies, what happens? Literally, they become you. This right here, everything is here. Your grandparents' consciousness your mother's consciousness, your father's consciousness, your children's consciousness, your dog's, your cat's consciousness. All the consciousnesses of all the people who have ever lived is right here, right now in your consciousness. But you are separating yourself from that because you need to create an identity of being a self. 
which is why you've created in the first place these ideas of my grandparents consciousness my mom's consciousness my dog's consciousness other people you know uh hitler from the past or caesar you know from the roman times who's long dead you think that these people have gone somewhere <laughs> they haven't gone anywhere <laughs> they're right here <laughs> only their forms have disappeared and you think that those people are dead only because in your mind you're attached to their forms see caesar is right here hitler is right here anyone who's ever died in your life is right here nothing has happened to them nothing bad has ever happened to anybody in reality that's the truth of death and of course this will all be radically denied totally denied by society by your family by your friends by your own mind And I will be called a devil for saying this. I will be called evil for saying this. I will be called a monster. I will be called deluded. I will be called a cult leader. I will be called insane. I will be called religious and woo and new agey for saying all these things. And why would I be called all those? Precisely because everything I said here has to be denied if you want to continue living life as a finite being. Which is why this is not going to be taught to you in school. You're not going to read it in some textbook. You won't see this on the evening news. No one is going to validate this for you. Nor should you believe me because, hey, you know, the things I'm saying are pretty outlandish. What if I'm wrong? What if I am deluded? What if I am crazy? What if I am a criminal? You don't know. From your point of view, you know nothing. So if you believe me, it gets you nowhere. You're still stuck being a finite being. And if you don't believe me, that's even worse. If you're sitting there doubting me, well, that also gets you nowhere. You're still a finite being. Still stuck in the delusion of thinking that there's death. So death really is, an, is a relativistic notion. What dies is your identity. From the absolute point of view, nothing dies. It's all just an infinitely reincarnating fountain. God is just a shapeshifter. It shapeshifts through an infinite number of forms. And it's not, not attached to any particular form. Therefore, it lives forever. It can't die. It's immortal. I remember the first time I became aware of the possibility of immortality. This happened long before I actually awoke and realized it personally. But, you know, we got to start somewhere. So usually the way this process works is that you hear stories of immortality and you think that they're just stories. Until one day you hear enough of these stories that a possibility, a radical new possibility opens up in your mind. That maybe they're not just stories. Maybe that immortality is actually possible. Not as a science fiction scenario where your brain gets uploaded into some computer. No, no, no. Actually possible as a function of changing how you perceive reality. That is the key insight that is necessary that 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 won't get you where you need to be that's just the key insight that opens the door through which then it's a long corridor you have to walk through that before you actually reach immortality so but that that initial opening of the door is a critical step and i can explain when i first realized this this was years before i actually awoke um i think i was reading some sort of zen parable, you know, those Zen koans and things, Zen, Zen stories, which are kind of fun and cute to read. And uh, I was reading this story where in this story, they were talking about a forest, trees in a forest. And this story said something along the lines of, 
uh, if a tree identifies with being a tree and that tree in that forest is cut down, that's the end of that tree. But if the tree identifies with being not a tree, but the entire forest, and one of the trees in the forest is cut down, the forest is immortal and it can never die. And when I read that, that was my first clue as to this being a real possibility. Because I realized at that point that what if I, my whole life is just like that tree? What if I'm misidentifying? If I switched my identity from being that of a human, this body, to that of being the entire universe, if I could make that shift in identity, that might be enough to make me immortal. And sure enough, <laughs> that's the case. <laughs> Now you might say, oh, Leo, but what about, what if they cut down the whole forest? If you cut down the whole forest, then, uh, then it's all dead. And so your immortality fails. That's correct, because this is just an analogy. You know, every analogy has its limits. Uh, so in this, in this analogy, if you did cut down the whole forest, that would be the end. Because you identify with being a forest. A forest is still a finite, limited formed thing. So for you to truly become immortal, you would have to not identify with being a forest. You'd have to identify with being infinite, with being the entire universe, with being nothing. Now you might say, ah, Leo, but the universe, even if I expanded somehow my identity, magically expanded it to include the entire universe, still, Leo, doesn't science tell, tell us that uh, the universe will collapse at some point? or it'll go into some sort of you know, heat death, or you know, I guess even the universe might be destroyed, maybe it gets sucked into some black hole, and then even the universe is gone. <laughs> That's right. So uh, this is the difference between a universe with a lowercase u and a universe with a capital uppercase u. So when I say universe, when I say identifying with the whole universe, I'm talking about universe as an absolute with an uppercase u. That's not the universe of science. The universe of science is a finite, limited, relativistic, formed thing which will die. It was born and it will die. So if you identify with, with our particular scientific universe, you're still going to be mortal. You need to identify with being uh, truly infinite. Infinite universe is a totality of everything that's ever possible, including all the multiverses and anything else out there beyond our universe, all of that. you got to identify with absolutely everything. That's the only thing that isn't created or destroyed. The totality, the unity, the oneness. If there's any hint of duality in your identification, then you're going to be mortal because every duality collapses. So you have to go so meta that you transcend any individual dualities and you identify with the entire movement of reality, of consciousness. This polarization and then depolarization, this division and merging. See, you can't identify with any one particular division. You have to be the whole thing. And uh, that's exactly what you'll become at your death. Pretty cool, huh? See, so uh, life is the opposite of cruel. Because what you don't realize is that this whole time you've been here in life, material existence, and your life has been endangered many times, you've suffered, and you've always faced this crippling fear of death and you know what if something goes terribly wrong with your children all this but what you don't realize is that when something does go terribly wrong with your children if it does let's hope it doesn't but if something does go terribly wrong with your children what you don't realize as a parent is that your child becomes infinite love so nothing is lost
Sí. That's the beauty of the design of life. Is that all suffering and all setback and all loss is all finite and relative. But the absolute is love and goodness. And it's always that. And so you really have nothing to lose and nothing to fear. But fear itself. The love is so great that you are too finite and weak to handle it. That's the tragedy of it. Everything that you think is evil or bad, everything you think that seems to undermine the love of the design of life, that's actually its very evidence. But you don't want to accept that because as a finite little, little limited being, from your point of view, you're just attached to survival. That's all you understand is survival. You can't understand infinite love. You can't understand death. It makes no sense to you. Your mind cannot handle the idea of death. So the irony is that it seems as though, well, oh, Leo, the things you're saying here are so outlandish and so unscientific and so mystical, it's so irrational and so full of wishful thinking, and it's like, who are you really kidding here? No. This is truth, and all of your pretenses to science, to materialism, to atheism, to rationalism, all of these ideas and, and identities that you've constructed about being a realist and being rational and being, uh, uh, like being hard nosed and being factual and being objective. All of this, this is all fantasies. This is all wishful thinking. This is all denial of infinite love. All of your skepticism, and doubt, all of your pessimism, all of your depression, all of your criticism, all of this is just a denial of infinite love. And you're going to lose this battle no matter what. Doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter how, how hard you fight, you are guaranteed to lose the battle to infinite love. You're going to melt into infinite love no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. And that is God's mercy for all of its creation. So you're playing a game you can't possibly lose, but you have fooled yourself into thinking you can lose it. And that's why you suffer. And that is the source of all evil. Evil is nothing other than a misperception of the truth. But your consciousness is so finite that you can't help yourself. You don't know how not to misperceive the truth. So this is the situation that we're stuck in. The entire process of life, of human growth, is the process of coming to realize your own finitude and ignorance, your own self-limitation, and then transcending your own self-limitations, your own self-deceptions. That's what all of your life is about, whether you realize it or not. And the extent to which your life becomes good and enjoyable and peaceful is the extent to which you align yourself with this process. And then the extent to which your life is miserable and full of suffering and pain and evil 
is the extent to which you resist this process, you deny this process, and you act like a stubborn mule, and you try to be selfish. And wisdom is aligning yourself with this process and moving directly towards selflessness as soon as you can, without detours, distractions, games, defense mechanisms, and all that other stuff that you do that we call human life. Yeah, it's a hell of a thing. But hey, don't take my word for it. Uh, discover for yourself what is the case. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you might wonder, well, Leo, what about reincarnation? What about that? From the highest absolute perspective, everything infinitely reincarnates. So, after this body dies, will there be some new body? Of course, probably. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the details of what will happen after this, my own body dies. So, I'm not going and going to make claims about that. I'm talking about the absolute perspective. From the absolute perspective, it doesn't matter what happens to this body. It doesn't matter if I turn into a giraffe or if I turn into an alien or if I turn into Hitler. Like, none of it doesn't matter. Because ultimately, from the absolute perspective, I already am all those things. I'm cycling through the entire uh, chain of being. And so are you. Because I am you and you are me. So, Right now, I'm sitting here shooting this, this video. I'm also sitting there listening to myself talk as you. See? So it doesn't matter. Unless you think it does. It's relative. So don't get stuck on this idea of a sort of finite, limited reincarnation. Reincarnation is unlimited. You might say, but Leo, how, how could you possibly know any of this? <laughs> I died. <laughs> I died. Through direct experience. And you can too. See, it, 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 it does you no good to sit there and speculate about this stuff, to theorize about it. Like, oh, well, what if Leo is right? Or what if he's wrong? Or, but I think this will happen. Maybe I'll turn into a giraffe. Or maybe I'll turn into an alien. Or maybe this happened. This, this doesn't help. What's necessary, and the only way you can understand what's being communicated here, is by actually dying. Of course, the problem is that that's, this is the last thing you want to do. You don't want to do it. Now you might say, oh, Leo, but, but if what you're saying is true, why don't you just shoot yourself right now? But that assumes I'm alive to begin with. I've already done it. Many times. So I don't need to shoot myself physically. You're attached to this whole physical thing. You don't need to physically kill yourself. Nor, don't get me wrong, I am not advocating that you physically harm your body whatsoever. I don't advocate suicide in the physical sense. What I'm advocating is that you realize that the duality between physical and mental is unreal and imaginary. That's what I'm talking about here. So don't, don't get me wrong. You might ask, well, Leo, but, but if I'm depressed right now and I'm in a miserable situation in my life, why do I have to work for awakening why don't I just kill myself right now, physically? Why don't I just shoot myself? And then I'll be infinite and I'll be God. Why don't I just do that? Well, you can. I don't recommend it for social reasons. I don't recommend it. But you certainly can. Thousands of people do every single year. Uh, but 
there's something wrong about it. Because you you still, when you do that, you still do it out of selfishness. You see? You see the problem? You're still doing it out of selfishness. The much better way to go about it would be to actually do the spiritual work instead. To overcome your suffering and your depression and all that. To rise above it, to transcend it. To do this not physically, but to do it at a, at a mental level or at an existential level. Transcend existentially and then to become a example for others of what's possible for them. And then to enjoy your life, enjoy existence. Enjoy the formed material world. You can enjoy all this stuff. It's amazing. It is amazing. And also remember, there's nowhere to go. So if I shoot myself right now, where am I going to go? I'm going to be right back here. I'm not going anywhere. From your point of view, it'll seem like this body disappears, but it doesn't matter. See? You're the one who's attached to this body. Not the awakened person. The awakened person is not attached to the body. So, um, so harming the body is completely unnecessary. This itself is egotism. Do the work to awaken. And appreciate the beauty of love manifest in physical form. You see, when you're totally formless as the Godhead, let's say after you physically die, there you can appreciate love in its totally pure, formless state. But it's even wrong to say that you can appreciate it because appreciation is still a formed, limited, finite process or thing. Don't worry about that. You'll be there. You came from there. You'll go back there. So don't worry about that. When you're here in this formed body and this formed realm, Enjoy and take it all in. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's remarkable. This is love crystallized, precipitated as matter. You're living in a in a matter slash love construction here. Appreciate that. Love and matter in its finite form is a beautiful thing. It's finite, but it's still remarkable and it's beautiful and it's worthy of appreciation because look, if you don't do it, who else will? You're the only one here. Someone has to appreciate all this stuff. You are here to appreciate what you are. You are both that formless thing, but you're also this formed thing here, and really they're not different. So appreciate it. The point of life is to awaken and then to appreciate yourself, and all of it is yourself. Appreciate the love that's here. Stop separating yourself from the love that you are. And then when your body dies, it dies and you're not attached to it. It's not a problem. And it's all good. See, that's my suggestion for you. Is this really possible? How could it be that humans can be immortal? Well, <laughs> I know it sounds outlandish, but that's literally what I'm saying is that you are immortal, but you ain't a human. So you have to let go of this idea of humans being immortal, because humans can't be immortal. Humans are a formed thing. Everything formed is mortal by definition. Even rocks and trees, planets, suns, stars, they're all mortal. But consciousness itself, truth itself, Love itself, these are immortal. These are absolutes. The absolute is the case under all circumstances. It doesn't change. It can't be created or destroyed. It has nowhere to go. You can't kill it because you have nothing to kill it with. When you have total oneness, realize this. If you have total oneness, oneness cannot kill itself because the process of killing something means that here it is, you have to go outside of it. That means you have to split it into two. 
one part of it has to then kill or attack the other part, then this part has to disappear, go to some, some other place, because these two parts, let's say, are in one part of the universe, there has to be some other part of the universe or somewhere else, the trash bin of the universe, so to speak, where all the dead stuff goes. You know, like in a, if you've ever programmed computers, there's, a, there's something called garbage collection. That means that when you create objects in a computer virtual world, to destroy these objects actually isn't that easy. This is actually a challenge for many video games and other computer simulations is that they have to construct the object, but that object is in memory. Then they have to destroy that object, but when they destroy that object, it still is retained in memory. You have to do special processes to dump that data somewhere else, but where are you going to dump that data if you have nowhere else to dump it to because you have one total oneness? You see, total oneness means that the very space where everything is, is the exact same space where the trash bin is. <laughs> We're inside the trash bin of the universe right now. This is the trash bin. Hello. <laughs> so you can't really kill yourself. In fact, this is a bit of a terrifying realization when you first have it. It's possible for you to realize that you cannot kill yourself. God cannot kill itself. And this is one of the paradoxes of God, because, you know, some of those paradoxes that are like, well, if, if God created rocks, can God create a rock that he himself can't lift? Interesting paradox. I've addressed it before in my FAQ about what is God, part two. Check out that FAQ where I address it. Um, but a, a similar paradox is this one. If God is all-powerful, can God kill itself? And if it can't, doesn't that mean that it's not all-powerful? What's the answer? Well, the answer is, is that God is all-powerful, but the one thing it can't do is it can't kill itself. Not as an absolute. It can kill itself in the relative domain. And really, another part of the answer is that the idea of killing itself, that is a dualistic notion that only exists in the relative domain. So this problem doesn't exist for God as an absolute. As an absolute, killing and death are, are null notions. You can't apply those dualistic notions to the absolute. But in the relative sense, God can kill itself. In the sense that it can create a human, the human is dissatisfied with its life, the human shoots itself, kills itself, and in this sense, God can kill itself. But that's only because God isn't fully one, isn't fully conscious. God is in its polarized form. And so what killing itself means is the unification of the polarization. You see, so once God is fully in its unified state, the notion of killing something or going somewhere else simply can't even arise, you see. Because what killing means is it means to unify, really. But how can you unify that which is already fully unified? You can't. So all that you need to do is change your identity from being that of a human to being that of God, and then you're immortal. And that is ultimately the power of truth. Pretty cool. That truth turns out to be so damn powerful. All right, that's it. I'm out of here. Please click that like button for me and come check out my website, actualize.org. There you'll find my blog, you'll find my book list, the Life Purpose course, new stuff that I plan to be releasing in the future. I have some more courses planned and other stuff that I'm working on. Um, and if you like my work, support me on Patreon. You could chip in five bucks a month or something like that, a small amount, but it could help me to expand the channel in the future, do maybe some advertising, attract more people uh, to this life-changing work. There we go. Now you understand what death is. Now you should never fear death ever again. <laughs>
But of course, in practice, you're going to be terrified of death for a long time to come. Even if you have awakenings, you're still going to be terrified of death because the, the self, letting go of all of your attachments, this is a much more challenging endeavor than simply having a few awakenings. To truly transcend the fear of death, an awakening won't be enough. You're going to need a massive fucking awakening. And even after that, Uh, you're still going to have attachments in practice. It's just really, really hard to purify this body and this mind of all of its attachments. Really hard. You can have family attachments, uh, relationship attachments, sexual attachments, even attachments to food, to money, to success, to comfort, to pleasure, to whatever. You're going to have attachments. It's really, really hard. Uh, you, could, you, could, you could make a lot of progress, but just keep in mind, it's really, really hard. It's going to be a lot harder than you think it is. But also, it's a, it's a highly worthwhile process to go through, even if you never become totally detached from absolutely all material existence. Uh, even a little bit of detachment will improve your life, will make it easier, will make it more enjoyable, will make you feel like a child again. And that's exactly what psychedelics do, is for that brief moment, those five or ten hours that you're in a psychedelic trip, during that time, you are detached from material existence. And it feels like heaven. It feels like paradise. It feels amazing. You wish you could be in that state all of your life. Uh, but of course, you probably can't. And the reason you can't is for your own good, so that you can keep surviving. See, so long as you're here, I don't care how awakened you are, so long as you exist in a finite formed way, so long as there is a body here, so long as there is a mind here, so long as language is being used, so long as food needs to enter your body to keep you alive, so long as that is the case, you're going to have attachments and you're going to be playing by the rules of survival. Because as soon as you stop playing by the rules of survival, you're going to die very quickly. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do that if you want. You can starve yourself to death if you want. Uh, but also, why? Why is that? Why is that something you should want to do? You're gonna die anyways. Uh, I mean, your physical body is. So why not instead choose to enjoy all this cool stuff that's here? And then when you die, you can exist as, as empty formlessness for uh, a, a trillion years even longer for eternity so uh, you can you can have your cake and eat it too is what I'm saying you don't need to choose one or the other you can have both that's how good reality is